Good afternoon, everybody. Before I get started, I just want to take a moment to say thank you so very much to Sarahji, to the organizers, to the sponsors, the staff, and to all of the attendees. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Let's give a round of applause to the organizers. All right. So I am dead program. Uh, some people in the real world call me dad or Ron, but that's not important right now. I am dead program, and I am a technologist for hire. Yes, you can pay me money for code. I have a consultancy called the Hybrid Group, where we create the software that makes your hardware work. And we contribute to some open source projects you may have heard of, like TinyGo. But this is Wasm.io, and I'm here to talk today about WebAssembly on microcontrollers. So the first question is, why? I mean, like, why would you do that? Like, my WebAssembly is not for, like, the web? What does this have to do? Well, I'm glad you asked this rhetorical question of me. So what if we want to create hardware devices that are extensible, like app stores for devices, or hardware that has software add-ons that are created by third parties or an ecosystem, user programmable machines? What if we want to create application-specific APIs for hardware. That way, we can have our game developers develop for our game platform, or we can have our operators in the factory do the work to configure the industrial control systems that make the cars and ships and airplanes that we need. What if we have devices that need updates? In other words, every device ever made, and we don't want to brick that device in the process of updating it. Well, Wasm Code is very compact. And it's a lot better over slow and high latency connections to be able to push these things there. So if you're using lower WAN or wide area networking. And device code that's portable. We can create platforms where we can use any language that can compile to WASM. And then, like whether that's C, Rust, Zig, or, oh yeah, Go. That's a language I, I've heard of, right? So actually doing this has been incredibly difficult. Like, Pretty much nobody's actually done this until now. Introducing Mechanoid. It's a framework for WebAssembly applications, for embedded devices, and for IoT devices. It's written using Go and TinyGo, but you can write modules that use any language that compile to awesome. Batteries included. Well, we're very much in the philosophy that everything you need should be there. You shouldn't have to go on a scavenger hunt across the internet to find all the different packages or crates or things that have a little piece of functionality you need. And it's built entirely on open source and is itself also open source. And TinyGo, that is the foundation of it. You may have heard of TinyGo, uh, possibly in WebAssembly, uh, since if you want to use Go and you wanted to use WASI, TinyGo was your only option until fairly recently. TinyGo has been around for quite a while. It supports 100 different pieces of hardware as far as boards, 100 different sensors and displays, so it's got pretty good capabilities. It's also based on WAD0, really cool project from our friends at Tetrate. And we use a package called Wipes, which is from my collaborator and co-contributor uh, Graham from Orsinia Labs. We'll see that in a minute. So what are embedded systems? Let's give a definition of what is an embedded system. Well, for us, that means microcontrollers, not single board Linux. It means 32 bit processors that have a single core and less than 256K of RAM. That's an embedded system. Otherwise, it's an embedded Linux. Right? That's a, this is a microcontroller. So TinyGo runs bare metal on hardware. We don't run a real-time operating system, none of that. Everything is bare metal. And we need that because with no operating system, we have all of this available memory for your actual application. Maybe the tiny Go and Go runtimes are the only real-time operating system you will ever need. All right. So Mechanoid works like this. This is the architecture. So we could see here we have an application. That's what you build. It talks to the Mechanoid engine. And then that engine communicates with the modules, the WASM modules, and then the hardware devices. So an example of how the Mechanoid engine works, so we have our application. Inside the Mechanoid engine, we have the interpreter. The interpreter is an interface that can work with any of the different WASM interpreters we currently support. Uh, WAS0 is one, and a little toy one, WASMAN, is another. Uh, we have a file store. That way, if you want to actually store information on your microcontroller, you, know, you don't need a whole disk system. You just need something to file store. 
the modules, and then the hardware devices you're going to integrate with, whether those be displays, networking, sensors, Bluetooth, etc. So let's take a look at the Hello World. So here's the architecture of the module. Okay. So we have on the microcontroller, we have this module. It's called ping.wasm. It exports one function called ping. Then our application, which is running on the host, right, that also exports a module function called pong. So when the host calls ping, ping is going to call pong, right? So ping calls, ping calls pong, and then the results of this go out the serial port. That way we can actually see what's going on. Let's take a look at the code. So here we've got the module itself. And can we see this OK? That's a little better. So we can see the module here. So it's package main like we see in Go. We've got the Go WASI import hosted Pong. That, OK, is what's exported by the host. And if you saw Akile and Rajiv's talk yesterday, you saw probably that. That was introduced to Big Go as part of the WASI P1. That was something we already had support for in Tiny Go for like two years before that. Um, then we go export the ping function. Ping calls Pong. That's it. Okay, pretty simple module. All right. Now let's look at the application code. What actually calls this? Hello. There we go. All right. So it's your basic Go program, and this is this is going to be compiled with Tiny Go. Um, but first, we'll compile it with Big Go. So we've got the mechanoid engine. We've got the interpreter that we saw before. We've got our wipes package. Wipes is used to make it easier on the host side to be able to get the information shared with the module, because this is a really common problem we have, right? How do we share data that's, unless it's trivial data? Like if you want to just pass it one single integer, that's not a problem. But we want to actually pass larger amounts of data. We need some, even strings can be non trivial for people who haven't done this. So that's what wipes is for. So we see we've got. You're using go embed for this example, which lets us actually embed the ping.wasm once we compile it. Then we create the mechanoid engine. We tell it to use the default interpreter. We initialize the engine, so now it's ready to do some work. So now let's define that host function. So we have our hosted function called pong, and that's going to be pong. It's got no parameters, so we say just wipes.h0, and that will do all the work for us to figure that out. We tell the interpreter, those are the modules we want to use to export from the host side. And then we'll tell the engine, load and run the WASM code. Okay, That's it. At that point, we're ready to go. We've got our instance of the module. And we can call that instance as ping. Then we sleep for one second, and we call it again. In the meantime, the pong function, when it gets called by the module, it will print pong and then return void. Okay, So ping, pong. Let's see the demo. No, not that demo. There we go. All right. There we go. OK, so if we say make, and it's, what is it again? Oh, yeah, simple. So now this is using WA0. It, the mechanoid command line tool, it does two things. One, it compiled the module using TinyGo with the smallest possible settings. Two, it compiled the Go code, which is actually the host, then ran it with WA0, and now it's all running. OK? You can give applause if you'd like. All right, that was a cheap shot, because that's just running on my computer. That was not what you came here to see, is it? Nope. All right, so let's actually do something more interesting. Let's say hello, Thumby. So the Thumby is actually the tiny circuit's Thumby. It's a Raspberry Pi RP2040 microcontroller with an ARM Cortex M0 Plus. It's a 32-bit processor, single core, runs at 133 megahertz with only 256K of RAM and 2 megabytes of flash for storage. That's it. Let's take a look at it. Well, not that one. There we go. So this is the Thumbie, and it's really small. It actually is literally the size of my thumb. I attach it to this keychain so I wouldn't lose it, because I kept losing it on the way here. So we'll take that, and we'll plug into it. It's kind of small, so it's hard to find, though. I promise you the smallest thing it could possibly work. This is the smallest thing I can actually do anything with. All right, so let's go over to my terminal here. And so instead of make symbol, well, actually, let's clear the screen. 
So let's make zombie. So same as thing that we saw before. So while we're waiting for that, let's take a quick look at the architecture. Same exact thing. The difference is we need to see something come out on the display of that. Otherwise, how do you know I'm not cheating again, right? You know, don't trust me, verify. So this application still got ping and pong. In this case, though, instead of just sending it out the serial port so we can view it on our screen, we're going to show the message on the screen. So I'm not going to even show you the same ping module because it's exactly the same, but I will show you the thumby. So we've got our same thing that we're doing with the Wasm code. We're loading the engine. We're telling the interpreter. We're defining the same host functions. We're running the module. Everything's exactly the same up till this point. Okay. The only difference here is now we've got this display device. Actually, I've, so the display device. Remember, I said we had the application. We have modules and we have devices. Right. Three. Rule of three. Four. What? I can't count that high. All right. So we've added our display. And so we're going to say display show message and ping and a counter. I added a counter. That way you can tell it's actually doing something consecutively. And then sleep for a second, repeat. The pong function is the same, as, except it now is going to use this reference to the display. That way, directly from the call from the module to the host, it will then send this message to the display. All right? So let's actually see it work. By now, it's actually working. Let's actually see the code. Executing. Might be kind of small. I can focus, don't worry. This is why I have a camera with focus. So I'm pretty sure that's the smallest thing that could possibly work at this point. It's the smallest thing you can actually see anything on, you know. And, Otherwise, it's like, OK, this is running on this chip. It has no output or display except for the serial port. So yeah, cool. All right, Wasm badge. How are we doing on time, by the way? Um, all right, doesn't matter. Keep going. So the WebAssembly conf conference badge. You've seen me going around pimping this. By the way, go on the social media, tweet or whatever the Mastodon thing is, toot. Um, Something with mechanoid I.O. in it, and the, totally arbitrarily, I will pick the one that seems the most egregiously awesome and give that person a badge. No battery, though. Sorry, I'm out of batteries. So this one's on the Adafruit Pi badge, which is um, actually, although it's physically larger, it's a smaller chip. Even though it's a more powerful chip, it only has 192 kilobytes of RAM. Yeah, let's, let's raise the state or lower the stakes. I don't know. Let's make it more difficult. And only 512K of flash storage. Like, it's really small. My god, how, do we, how is this going to work? How are you going to make it fit? So you've seen this badge already. I should, I've got to focus the other way. Uh-oh. Can he do it? Autofocus doesn't work too well. So yeah, you've seen this. You've seen me pimping this around here at the conference. Thumbie's still running. All right. Let's look at this architecture real, real briefly. So the modules here, there's a separate module for each of the things on the badge, as I've mentioned. Each of those exposes a function to the host, a start function and an update function. Then our devices, we've actually created an abstraction called badge. That way, it's a little easier for us if we want to create new modules to have an API that we don't have to worry about the details of the hardware. We just say, change the heading, change this text, change this text, and go. So if we take a quick look at the badge code, so this is the module, and this is the my name is module. It's again, it's tiny go compiled. We've got a few constants. This is what shows up on the if you have one of the badges that you got. This is what appears on there. We define a buffer, buffer here. That way, we do not have to allocate any memory at all in the module because this whole allocating memory like it's going out of style, like we've got plenty of memory. Stop doing that. Don't do heap allocations. I know you're wondering, how do I do that with any language? Well, we'll talk more about that in another talk. So here's that start function. It causes the badges set text one function to whatever your name is. And then on the update, it changes text three and four. All right? So if we take a look at, um, actually, let's go back to that very briefly so we can look at the badge code, because that's kind of neat. So we have a module with the badge in that Again, running in the module. Okay, this is not on the host. And this is what is using our Wasm import to bring in the host exported functions in a way that they're easy to use from our module. 
Okay, remember, we're creating an API that you use in your module to do things on that physical hardware. And this way, we can see this is how we do this. All right. So now let's take a quick look at the application code. The application code is pretty similar to what you've seen. Don't fail me now, internets. Internets, come back. There we go. All right. So it's very similar to what we saw before. Um, one difference is we're still using Go Embed, but we're now we're bringing in multiple WASM files, and we could treat that like a file system. And here, our main function, we're using a couple of other packages, I should mention. One of them is the board package, which is an experimental hardware abstraction layer that is not officially part of TinyGo yet, but it will be soon. Another is the TinyGo drivers package with the pixel package in there, which is officially released. And you'll see why we need this in a minute, because this same code will run on many different displays. So if we use the simulator, wait, simulator? Hold on. You'll, we'll get to it. Then we run the simulator, use these settings. Otherwise, our run function, we just say, whatever board we're using, pass the con display configuration. All right? Then our run function, we're using Go generics. The reason for this is that way, this exact same code will run with whatever display is already supported, regardless of the resolution. It could be one of the displays that has 8-bit color or mono color or some obscure kind of color encoding scheme. So now here we're doing the same exact thing, but we are using some extra debug statements that are part of Mechanoid. So we new engine, we add our display device, we add our badge device, init the engine, configure our buttons, because we need to be able to push the buttons and have something occur, right? Then we display our home page screen which is the thing that you've seen me scrolling through with the list of the different programs. We read our input from the button. Based on which button we push, we either scroll through the list, or we run that WASM. Now, run WASM, what that actually does, let's go take a look at the runner. Very good. All right, so the runner, run WASM, we take, we do some garbage collection so that all of our 192K that's free is available to us. We open the module by reading it in from our little pseudo file system. We tell the interpreter to load it and then to run it. <clears throat> the reason why we don't just use load and run is this way we can close that file to free up all the available memory before we actually get around to running it. We clear the badge text. We call that start function. Then repeatedly, we call the update function and then look to see if any buttons are pushed if we're trying. For example, we press that select button and we want to go back to get out of this program. That's how we do it. All right? And then the rotation is the same thing. It's just it loads it for 10 seconds. And then after 10 seconds, it halts and loads the next one. All right? So let's see this run in a simulator. So when you're doing hardware development, it can be quite a pain because you don't actually have the hardware sometimes. It isn't even out yet. Or the one you have has actually been bricked last week by your colleague. So we can use our simulator. So we're compiling all of the WASM modules. And then we have the TinyGo, or we have the Mechanoid simulator, which is actually part of this boards package. And you might notice it looks exactly the same because it's, in fact, the exact same code, thanks to Go Generics. So if I want to say my name is, I can press the A button on my keyboard. I can press Escape on my keyboard. And if I press the Return key, it's the same as pressing Select. So it'll just start running through each of them. And then after 10 seconds, it'll jump to the next one. All right, so far so good. So you've already seen that on the badge. So I don't have to show you that again, do I? Would you like me to? Of course. All right, let's see it on the actual badge. Real. The real badge. Unplug Thumbie. Plug in the badge. Turn it on. Go over to my window. It's still flashing. This is the code from before. Now, the tiny go act of compilation is not that fast. There are reasons for that that we will work on. Uh, we slowed it down because we used link time optimization in LVM, and we were running some concurrency problems. Um, but the code it produces is way, way, way faster than Big Go. 
Um, that's one reason why a lot of people are using TinyGo for their WebAssembly modules. Anyway, you see it now actually running. Kind of, kind of glare screen, but you can see it counting. All right, so it's real. It works. All right. Wasm drone. A WebAssembly drone flight controller. Again, the same Adafruit badge, but also using the Adafruit Airlift Wi-Fi Featherwing. Now, if you've gotten a look at my badge, you've been like, is this based on an ESP32? It has a separate ESP32-based daughter board that's stuck on the back of it for this exact purpose. And then I'm going to use my DJI Tello drone, which I brought along, which is a not open source in any way, shape, or form. Um, actually, a group of us did a bit of reverse engineering of the Wi-Fi protocol a couple years ago. You can read about that on the Hackaday and the uh, Hackster if you are interested. Now, uh, we're running out of time, so let's just take a very quick look at the hardware. This is the actual drone. It is plugged in. It is turned on. That is good. All right, and so let's go here. This is the architecture application. Our module is the drone.wasm. It's going to be sending commands to the drone device, which is then going to be using the serial peripheral interface spy connection to the separate Wi-Fi microcontroller, which will then be sending those commands, commands that are created by the drone device, the Wi-Fi is just a pass-through, to the actual Tello. And if we take a quick look at the drone code, because we're really quite running out of time, this is the module. This is the WebAssembly. And so it exports, for example, a button, the select button. When we press that, it does a flip. When we press the start button, it'll take off. A B button for landing, then up, down, left, right for those directions. OK, that's enough to fly a drone, isn't it? Sure. Then the application code, very similar to what we've seen before, right? We're still using the board package so that we can see things on many different displays. In this case, same thing. We create the engine, the interpreter. We have our display device. We have our drone device that we're passing in the SSID and password because it needs, it's a Wi-Fi device. Our buttons, we set our display so we know it's actually starting to run. We tell the Tello to start. And then our WebAssembly module, every time we press our buttons, we basically, it looks like I disabled A for some reason in this, but. I wonder why. I wonder what will happen. Hmm, that should be interesting. And then um, we've got our key select, all these different bits, up, down, left, and right. All right? So let's see this. This should be interesting. So we have to flash the, uh, the badge. And we're using a capability of the Mecha command line tool, which is to pass in parameters at compile time that are going to actually be used um, during, for example, the SSID of the drone, right? So it built, it's flashing it, and then we should actually see, now it's thinking about connecting. It's connecting to the drone. Let's see if it actually works. Starting the drone, okay, that's good. Hmm. Let's see, how did this work again? I'm trying to remember. Let's see, I think if I push these buttons, it's in takeoff mode, so if I do that, it should take off. Oh, yeah, OK. That's all, so far, so good. Here, face the people drone. So yeah, I'm, 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 on, I'm only keeping this plugged in. Well, do I need to really keep it plugged in? What happens if I unplug it? Hmm. Huh. I wonder if it still works. Yeah, so far so good. So what did this drone do besides like fly around? Well, didn't I, doesn't it do like a flip or something? Yeah. Okay. It, it can fly around. It does stuff. Hey, let's face the cameraman. It's looking at you, looking at it. I'm not going to turn on its camera because then that could cause, never let the streams cross. Someone told me that once. That was one of the pieces of advice I didn't follow. Similar to the don't fly drones at conferences. 
that was a, I was given that advice, and uh, for some reason, I, that was one of those simple instructions I could not understand. I'm a software developer. I don't take simple instructions. I need complicated ones. So it actually does work. See? It's, this is all quite real. I can't even believe it myself. All right, well, I feel like we've pretty much done as much risk-taking as we can for one day. So uh, let's cut it in for landing. Come on, little baby. Come on, come on, little drone. Don't be scared. You can do this. You can land. Hello. Come on. Don't be scared. The, the people are nice. This is an open source conference. Didn't you deactivate the button? <laughs> huh. Maybe that was the problem. It's okay, little drone. So yeah, it's all pretty real. I mean, uh, it's kind of amazing that this actually works, isn't it? So I call this flight testing. And uh, you know, you've heard of flight testing in software development, but have you ever seen a flight test that involved a real flight? So that was actually the first time on Earth anyone's flown a Wasm controlled drone. So welcome to the world premiere. So join the evolution. You could either build the machine or flee from the machines. It's up to you, my friends. Mechanoid.io, you can follow us. Uh, it, it's actually Mechanoid.io on Twitter. There's our Mastodon, Mechanoid at Mastodon.social. And uh, make sure to tweet. In about half an hour, I will decide which one of these egregiously fawning tweets is the one that gets the badge. And in the meantime, check out Mechanoid. Thank you so much. I don't think we have time for questions. We do? Five minutes? Oh, amazing. Wow, I really got through that, okay. So, uh, questions? You must have questions. Yes? When will we get a conference badge which, which you can also use a Bluetooth controller to skip the slides? Oh, well, that's actually quite possible. Um, this same chip, uh, the ESP32, has actually got um, full Bluetooth chipset in there as well. And I was flying, at, at Fostam, I was flying a Bluetooth-powered drone in addition to the Wi-Fi-powered drone. So the answer is yes. Um, in the simulator, we have seen some coordinates. Is it also a gyroscope on the chip, on, so the, on the board? Great question. The question was, in the simulator, it looked like there was some like gyroscope or things. So actually, that simulator is used um, in addition for some smartwatch development that we're doing where you need to be able to detect the accelerometer and the angle and treat it like a touch screen. So uh, that's the reason why that support is built into the simulator. You can actually do really cool smartwatch development with uh, TinyGo. And I'm sure you could run WebAssembly on it. I just haven't gotten that watch to try it. More questions? I was a bit late to the meeting, but I'd like to, to ask how TinyGo is dealing with um, the lack of um, garbage collection mechanisms that are typically found in Go, right? So what differences do you have in TinyGo compared to like Go on a computer uh, so you can run it on microcontrollers? Sure, great question. Um, so TinyGo is full Go. It's not like a subset of Go or part of Go or like some weird vernacular. It is the Go programming language according to the formal language specification. It does use a different runtime. With TinyGo, you do have garbage collection. One big difference, though, is that with TinyGo, you can actually choose which garbage collector you wish to use when you compile your code. So the default is a mark and sweep garbage collector, you know, like the basic one you would implement in your university compilers type class. Um, nothing as sophisticated as the amazing garbage collector in Big Go. But we only have a single core of execution. Um, another of the pluggable garbage collectors we have is Leaky. Leaky does not collect. Like, wait, why would you do that? 
Uh, there's these things called serverless WebAssembly functions, and they just do some work and then terminate. So there's no need to collect, there's no need to deallocate. So um, we have a couple of other garbage collectors that are under development as well. So it, this is how we deal with, now of course, whether you're using big Go or tiny Go, the best thing to do is avoid heap allocations entirely. But that might be very, very difficult. We do have some tooling in TinyGo um, when you compile your TinyGo code. There's a flag that you can use to determine where heap allocations are happening so you can try to eliminate them. Because if you want really good performance Go code, whether it's tiny or big, you definitely don't want to do heap allocations. Is that it? Cool, well thank you so much, really appreciate it.